All right, we'll get started. Good morning. Good morning. I did not bring a drive-in worship handbook for you, but if you get real excited, flash your lights or toot your horn or do something. Our call to worship this morning is from James chapter 1 that says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Dad passed out some hymn books, so uh, we're going to sing together this morning. Let's uh, begin with, uh, this is the day the Lord hath made. If you need to look at those words, they're on page 571. 571. So, the instructions are, when you hear me singing, you start singing. <laughs> and, uh, we'll make it work now. If you're uh, by yourself in your vehicle, uh, feel free to sing as loudly as you can. And then, if you have other occupants, sing as loud as they can stand. You can sing. That will make it work then. <clears throat> Here we go. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Well, since this is all new, what we're doing today, uh, let's try something else. I'm gonna, let's sing it again, and I'll start it out, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop because I want to hear you all, okay? So you gotta really sing out. I'm gonna start with you. Don't drop, don't quit when I quit, okay? And then I'll rejoin you. All right, here we go. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, how about... Uh, Number 98, 98, come thy fount of every blessing. I'll give you just a second to find it. 98. All right, here we go. Come thy fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me song by Lord, yes, son it Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount i fix upon it Mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hold by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus taught me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm 
constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. As things are a little bit different than normal, uh, we do not need to forget those uh, who are struggling with sickness, those whose families uh, are being affected. Uh, by tests of their faith. We need to continue to pray for them. So let's take just a minute. Uh, I know Brother Carlos, uh, Doris's brother, is still fighting cancer. Uh, he started a treatment last Tuesday? Thursday. Okay. How did that go so far for him? Okay. Good. Okay, good. Good. Let's continue to pray for him and others as well. Uh, even as we uh, try something a little bit different, do things a little bit different here, uh, we are learning how to be the body of Christ regardless of the circumstances. And I think this is a wonderful exercise for us as the American church uh, to really be tested on what we understand the body of Christ really is. So let's pray for the church itself across America, and let's pray for America with this sickness coming through, that the Lord would uh, protect us and that we would also uh, take opportunity to examine our lives before him and repent of the sins of the nation so that we as his church as his people can worship him uh, with a clear conscience so let's pray this morning father we do thank you for your goodness and your mercy father you only give good gifts to your children and so lord uh, we thank you for everything that you do for us and lord as we pause for a moment to remember those who are struggling either with sickness or trials in their life father we want uh, to ask you to to intervene uh, Father, that you would um, bring glory and honor in the lives of those who are serving you. And Father, you would bring peace um, that can't be found from any other source than you. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So this morning, as uh, we finished up last Sunday, going through the 18 Articles of Faith, and so as I was trying to figure out what it was the Lord wanted me to preach on today uh, to lead us in. Um, so many times there are things that he's working on in my own life uh, that just fits right in line of what we need to look at, I believe, as, as a church. If you would turn with me to James chapter 1. Book of James chapter 1. Our call to worship this morning, I read verses... 2 uh, through 4. I'm going to read, read those again. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, faith comes from testing, and in times of trials, when we are faced with this whole pandemic that's turning our lives upside down, it's a great opportunity for us to have our faith tested, to exercise what it is we believe. I look at Christians, you know, those older mature Christians, the ones that never seem to be bothered by anything, the ones that uh, seem to always have an answer for what's going on around them. And I ask myself, how do I become like that? How do I become steadfast? How do I become rock solid in my faith? Well, the way that we become rock solid in our faith, the way that we become strong in our faith is the same way that a bodybuilder becomes strong in his body. We have to exercise our faith with trials, with tribulations. Now, I say we have to exercise. They come. We don't have to ask for hard times. We don't have to ask for things that stretch us beyond what we can handle. They just automatically come in this life, do they not? As Sister Doris said, I'm not but 35 years old, which is not very old. And yet, it's still old enough to know that trials and tribulations come. 
We live in a world that's affected by sin, and so there will be times that we will struggle. There will be times that we have to exercise faith. Even today, as we think about the last several weeks and the last couple of months, as everything in our life has been changed and kind of turned upside down, I brought the, the, the wooden pulpit outside just because it's somewhat familiar to me. Because everything else is changing, is it not? Everything else in our lives is, is, is turning upside down and we don't know how it's going to fall. I mean, our governor yesterday put into effect a shelter-in-place order and reading on social media and talking to people, there's so many different reactions to what that actually means and what, what are the rules and what can we do and what can we not do. And, and, and when you read the rules and you learn the facts... It's not really that much different than what we have been doing, except it's a very strong warning to be careful how we transmit this disease. Our normal lives, however, are gone. Brandy's here from school. She was in Michigan. That's completely changed. Several of you uh, are no longer in your grade schools. Elizabeth is was in college. She's not now. Nobody is. Some people have lost jobs. Some people's uh, income has gone away. We, we're not even sure if we're going to have food in the stores. We're not sure where our next meal may come from for some of us. Even the government is trying to figure out how to keep people spending money and how to get people money. This is not a political statement. It's just a fact that's going on. How to keep the economy alive. We are scrambling for answers while in our own minds and hearts we're still asking the question, who's going to live and who's going to die? Because more and more people are dying. Some of us are even considering whether or not we're going to have to defend our own homes because if the food shortage gets so bad that we don't have what we need, what if other people, what if my neighbors come and try and get food from my house because their family is starving and how do we handle those sorts of things and when we stop and we consider all these things it can very easily overwhelm us because this is a lot of things we have to deal with that we've never had to deal with before. This is America. This is not normal. And yet here we sit in our cars in the parking lot of the church because things have changed. We must have faith. Now let's look at faith for a few minutes. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Down at the bottom there, verse 37. Hebrews 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, that's a little statement there, but there's a lot there. Uh, God is telling us it's not going to be long. In a little while, the coming one will come, and he will not delay. And that is speaking of Christ and his return. Christ will come back. It won't be long. And he's not going to delay in coming. When the time is here, Jesus will come. He's not going to stop off and go shopping on the way. He's not going to stop off for sightseeing on the way. When the time comes for Christ to come back, he will get up off the throne and he will come. Just like that. No hesitation on his part when the time comes. But until then, verse 38 says, God says, my righteous one shall live by faith. We as the children of God, we as the ones who say we believe in God, we must live by faith. This is not a suggestion of God. This is not something where he says, hey, it would be a good idea if you live by faith, or may I suggest that you do this. He says the righteous one shall live by faith, which means if we are not living by faith in God, we are not righteous. Continuing verse 38, it says, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If we want God to find pleasure in his children, we must be righteous which means we must live by faith. If we do not live by faith, and if we shrink back our cowardness, the soul of God has no pleasure in us. Verse 39 says, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I love that statement. I am not one of those that shrink back. 
I'm not going to do that. My faith will be tested, it will be tried, and it will come out stronger than what it is. Because I will not shrink away from the call of God. God will provide. I trust in Him. So if we move over to the next chapter, in chapter 11, Hebrews 11, the, the chapter of faith that we call it in the Bible circles here, it starts off with the definition of faith. And we know that, uh, that now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And, and we think, what in the world is that? It literally means we believe in something that will come. We haven't seen it. We haven't experienced it. We can't touch it. But we believe that it is going to come. That's what faith is. It's not logical. It's not something we can figure out. It is a simple commitment before a holy and righteous God that we will believe His Word. We will believe what He said. I can't see it, but I know it'll come. Verse 2 in Hebrews 11, For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. This is our statement, our, our foundational statement of faith. When we start believing, we start having faith, we have to start with creation. That's the very beginning. We believe that God said... And there was. Everything outside, I mean, what a great time for us to break church tradition. And we're still going to meet with whatever requirements are placed on us. We're still going to meet. And right now we're outside where we can look at God's creation. You can look at everything around you. The vehicle you sit in, the body that your soul is uh, inside right now, all of these things was made by the Word of God. He spoke it into existence. This is what I believe. This is where my faith starts. That God himself has the power to create something from nothing. You remember that little joke with the scientist that says, to God we no longer need you because we now know how to create life. And God says, okay, show me. So the scientist picks up a handful of dirt and God says, whoa, 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 get your own dirt. And the truth behind that little statement is that nothing we use on this earth, nothing we manipulate on this earth is created out of nothing. The only thing we can do as humans on this earth is manipulate what God has already created. And we learn more of His rules and we know, learn more of how to use what He gave us. But we do not have the power to create something from nothing. We must always start with something. In other words, we are not creators, but God is. We believe that he created everything we see out of something that could not be seen. He goes on to say that Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And verse 6 is important to us. It says, and without faith... It is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith in his word. If you do not believe the word of God, if you do not trust in the word of God, you do not please God, and he is not pleased with you. This is the simple, applicable truth of this verse. It is impossible to bring pleasure to God if you do not believe His Word. And that's not portions of His Word. That is His Word in its entirety. All of His words. He tells us about Noah being warned of God. And we looked at him a few weeks ago and over a hundred years building the ark with people laughing at him. For a type of, type of event that no one had ever seen before, the flood. Abraham obeyed. He was called to leave where he lived and to go somewhere else for an inheritance. And so he went. He didn't know where he was going. He just went. Sarah, his wife, was too old to conceive a baby. They didn't have any children. And God promised Abraham that a whole nation would come from him. But out of faith, she believed the word of God and... She conceived a child. 
Verse 13 says, All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. Now, this is so vital for us as we consider what faith is. We must not have too short of a vision of faith. Faith for today is not good enough faith to please God. These people made decisions to obey a command of God when they never saw the fulfillment of the promise from God in their physical body. That means their faith outlived their life. Their faith was stronger than their body. It was stronger than what they saw. They didn't live for themselves in the lifestyle they live in. Faith to please God is faith that is bigger than our lives. Faith enough to please God is faith that causes us to leave our homeland, that's earth, for a better country, that's heaven. And when we have this kind of faith, it changes the way that we think. Right here in verse 14, it says, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. These people who were called of God to leave what they had known, to go where they didn't know where they were going... Noah, who was called to build a boat for a flood when nothing like this had ever happened on the earth up until that time. For Abel to bring a sacrifice to God that was acceptable when Cain would not. For Enoch, who walked with God and did not die. They were living as citizens of another land. I think it's important for us to consider as Americans. I'm an American. It is by God's grace that I was born here in America. And then I'm the citizen of this country. And therefore I have responsibility to it. So don't, don't misinterpret what I'm fixing to say. I support this country. Very much I do. It is a gift of God and we should be responsible with it. But I'm an American second. I'm a citizen of heaven first. Which means I am to obey the rules of heaven before I obey the rules of earth. Much less the American country. Now this is not a rebellious statement, as I said. This is not an overthrow of the government statement. Not at all. Not at all. But how I live my everyday life and what I get worried about and what I don't get worried about is directly changed based on this truth. I am a sojourner here. In fact, we're all sojourners on this earth. This is not a Christian statement. This is not a saved or lost statement. This is not a follower of God or not statement. Every single human being is a sojourner on this earth. What are the two sure things in life? Somebody shout it out. Death's one of them. Taxes is the other one. If you're not dead, you'll pay taxes, but don't worry, you're going to die. Right? So much truth in that statement, is it not? The two sure things in life is death and taxes. Death is ordained of God and taxes are ordained of man. As long as man's on this earth, somebody's going to pay somebody something. But be sure of this. Taxes one day may be done away with, but death before Christ comes back is certain. We will die, whether you're saved or whether you're not. That means we are all sojourners of this earth. Do we live as sojourners? Uh, over New Year's, John, I went to the Dominican Republic, and it was a great trip. It was amazing. It was awesome. I was there for a short time. I didn't change my address. I didn't change my contact information. I didn't pack all my clothes because I was only there for a short, short time. 
I didn't reorder and get all my affairs straight here because I was coming back. If I apply that, though, to spiritual things, am I living as if I am leaving? Or am I living as if I am staying? How that changes the way that I think about things is very drastic, church. The things that bother the world and the things that get the world upset. Not worried about myself. This is only for a short period of time. This is not my home. Matthew chapter 6, if you would turn there with me. In Matthew chapter 6, we have the Lord's Prayer where we're taught by Jesus to pray and ask uh, one of the portions of that is to give us this day our daily bread. The verse 19 is where I want us to go and read here for a little bit. Matthew 6 verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." When we understand that we are sojourners here on this earth, the way that it shifts our thinking uh, is things are temporary. Things that we think are long-term are not long-term. Everything on this earth is temporary. One of the big things that we work for, but as we're still the working age and working for a living, is we're thinking about retirement. We're building up an investment for the future. But church, if we don't take that to the spiritual realm and we only use that mindset to build up an earthly retirement and we're not looking for a spiritual heritage, we have nothing. We'll be like the rich man that had so much stuff coming in. His barns were not big enough. And he said, tear the barns down and build bigger barns. And the Lord looked at him and said, you fool, tonight, tonight I require your soul. We are sojourners on this earth, church. This is why faith is so important. You see, what we, what we can't see, what we're hoping in, what is to come, is the life that is to come. The permanent life. If we get worried over viruses, if we get worried over whether or not there's toilet paper in the stores, I mean, how, how ridiculous. I saw a little cartoon on Facebook. It was two dinosaurs standing side by side, and one of them said, oh, look, an asteroid's coming. 
And the other one said, quick, let's go buy some toilet paper. Anybody chuck? Are y'all awake? Anybody awake out there? Okay, good. Oh, there's some, there's some flashing lights. Is that not as stupid as what we just got through doing a few weeks ago? There is a virus coming that could make us sick and could kill us. Quick, go buy some toilet paper because the news told us that there was a shortage. I don't know if we've bought any toilet paper yet or not. Have we bought any toilet We still haven't bought any toilet paper. Since all this began, we still haven't. I trust... I, seriously, I trust that the Lord will provide what I need. If it's leaves out in the front yard, then so be it. There's plenty of them. The question is, what does it take to rattle you? What does it take to make you scared? And if it's not the direct move of God that makes you scared, if you're scared of something less powerful than God, you're afraid of the wrong thing. And you do not have faith in God. At times, we're all there. At times, we're all faced with something that we're more afraid of than God because our faith must be tested and tried. And so the Lord places us in positions to where we only have Him to turn to. And what a great opportunity we have, church, right now during this time. Sorry. Come back on. That kicked off. See if you can turn that back on, Tim. What a great opportunity we have right now as the church to proclaim to the world, there it is, thank you, you just have to walk up to it, who it is that we follow, who it is that we have faith in. Are we really trusting mankind to save us from this virus? Or are we calling out to God to say, Lord, have your perfect work. If we say that God is sovereign, that means he is sovereign over everything. He is sovereign over Governor Ivy putting the shelter-in-place order in place. I am not defacing our governor. I am not speaking evil of that position at all. But my faith and my hope is not in the governor. And it never will be. My faith and trust is in God, who is over the government officials. My hope and faith is in God who is over the president. I am so grateful that God appears to be working through President Trump. But my hope and faith is not in President Trump, and it never will be. It is in God. Now what a great opportunity we have, church, to say, Lord, whatever it is you want us to do, we'll do it. How you want us to do it, we'll do it. Yes, we're taking precautions out here. We're in our own vehicles and everybody's separate. That's what's suggested by the health department, and I think they're right. So that's what we're doing. But that doesn't mean we have to stop coming together as a church. That doesn't mean we have to stop worshiping him. The church is not closed because of some pestilence. In fact, I remember some stories in the Old Testament, right, where there was over ten different, type, ten different types of pestilence that come. Remember that out in Egypt? Did the people of God ever stop worshiping? Did the people of God ever turn their back on, on the Lord and say, Oh, well, God, we can't, we can't worship you anymore. And when the time of Passover was started, the people of God went into their home with the blood painted on their doorpost. Because that's what the Lord told them to do, and they had faith in the word of God. The instruction of God and they obey it. Church, the opportunity we have now is not just to believe God because of this virus. Well, the opportunity we have is to believe God and to repent of our sins. How many other areas in Scripture do we not believe God in? How many little pet sins do we allow to live in our lives? Things that we keep hidden in our closet because that's back there. It doesn't really matter when God says, I am a jealous God. I will be God over everything in your life. You see, obedience to the Word of God does not start with duty. It starts with faith. That's why Scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Because I have to believe that God will punish sin the way He says He will punish sin. But I also believe that God will bless His children the way that He says He will when we seek Him. 
Go back with me to the book of James. Back to James chapter 1. Starting in verse 5. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I started in verse 2. Let's just keep reading. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the lowly brother boasts in his exultation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, if we're going to live by the word of the Lord, in Matthew 4, 4, when Jesus told Satan that it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the foundation of our faith. If we believe in God, that means we must believe every word that comes from his mouth. Whether it is written in scripture or is what the Spirit guides us into doing that agrees with his scripture. The foundation of truth and the only truth we have is the word of God, the Bible. In church, we must strive to believe everything in it. We cannot believe portions of it. We cannot apply what we want to apply where we want to apply it. But these trials, these temptations, these the temptations to sin, the trials of pestilence and things going on in our world now is simply an opportunity for our faith to grow. Yes, we need to exercise common sense. We understand what germs are. We can learn how they work and how to cleanse our bodies of them the best we can. But what an opportunity to be able to trust God because do you trust in Germex or do you trust in the power of God? Proclaim your faith, church, and let it grow. Pray with me this morning. Fathers, we have heard from your word. We thank you so much for your grace. Father, for your power and, and the desire to obey you, to have faith in you, Father. Lord, I pray that our faith will grow. Lord, I don't have to ask for opportunities for my faith to grow because, Lord, you give them to us sometimes every day. And, Father, even now as we're going through this time in our country, this, this disease and this pestilence moving through the whole world, Father, I pray that your people, that your church would remain faithful to you. Father, to obey your word. Father, to live in the power of Christ, knowing that nothing is more powerful than you, Father. And nothing is more powerful than Jesus Christ because you have given him all authority. And Father, we have fallen under that authority to Jesus. Lord, may we continue to obey him and believe in him. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.